Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Director Watch, an awards watch podcast that attempts to get inside the mind of cinema's greatest auteurs, explore what drives them, and maybe we go on a few unrelated tangents along the way. I'm Ryan McQuaid, the executive editor here at Awards Watch, and joining me as always is my co host, Jay Ledbetter. And today we are talking about a film in which Michael Shannon contemplates the potential of an oncoming apocalypse and how exactly to deal with with his paranoid visions. I'm speaking, of course, of Take Shelter. It's going to be an exciting review. Jay. Um, So I'm ready to get into it. Yeah. Jay, this is this is becoming a problem in that you're forgetting Uh that we're not reviewing a movie from another series. I mean, I'm sure a Jeff Nichols series would actually be kind of interesting, to be fair. Probably would. Yeah. Uh, Because he's got the bike riders coming out this year, but we're not going to do that this year. Um. We're actually talking about William Freakin's bug. Man, people just keep making the same movie. I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> but bug, man. Bug. We're talking bug. Get your extermination. William Friedkin in his Tracy Letts era. Guys out. Yeah. Well, yeah, He. this is the beginning of his uh, two Letts. Yep. Let's make some movies. That's what he said. William Friedkin. Uh, yeah. Bug, you excited to talk about this? I am excited to talk about this. I mean, this is sort of, is this Friedkin coming back to his true auteur kind of a little bit? I mean, The Hunted, we both liked a lot, but it feels kind of like a... Do you want to talk about The Hunted again? Yeah, you know what? Let's just talk about The Hunted again. Let's do that. Yeah, so like, how would you make your knife? Um, <laughs> uh, I do it crocodile Dundee style. Oh, okay. All right. I see that's what you're doing. Partner. That's, that's a not, a, that's a knife. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that because, cause he tried to go back to the studio, right. And he tried to go back to kind of making those bigger films. And he I, tried to were, make a commercial movie two times and in a year, row. He decided what if a movie didn't make money (laughs) what if i just make movie yeah and it comes out and it's something small and it's contained yes very much so but does it say much it's the question i think it has plenty to say but we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about it um You've you've done the research on this because this is it's straight from the hunted to this. It is straight from the hunted to this. There's not a ton of research to do. It's gonna this get is... it's gonna get a little tougher as we get to these last three because because of the more newer films. Like this is the the third to last movie he right. made. Right. Well, they're newer and then they're not The Exorcist. Right. I mean, they're not. They haven't. Written... Well, hey, now people like Bug. They they do like Bug. <laughs> But it's not The Exorcist. Uh, it, it it made you know one Speak for yourself sixtieth of what The Exorcist <laughs> made, uh, and, and that's before you account for inflation. So and taxes, all yeah. those taxes, they'll get you. Yeah. yeah, but this is. I mean, it was a it was a it's an interesting film, a film I I actually like a lot, and it is Friedkin. Friedkin has been in director jail for the large majority of his career. And he's made a lot of films based on plays that are cheap. And mm-hmm. this was a pretty cheap film to make. And luckily, Friedkin is really good at making films like that feel cinematic. Yeah. And he has this documentary cinema verite style to him that I think gives a real sense of life to these very contained films. And this one... It, it's a it, it is despite it being kind of a smaller movie it does have a pretty interesting uh production history this was a 21 day shoot i think yeah. somebody recommended friedkin go see this play and then he saw the play loved it wanted to go talk to tracy letts tracy letts was like eh, just, i mean what do you think you're gonna make a movie out of this what are you talking about and then they really Did tracy let's not know who William freaking was? No, he knew who freaking was, but he was like, what? But he, he, yeah, you're going to make a movie out of this? He's probably like heard that a dozen times. Like, yeah, your play is pretty much. Be a he movie, was skeptical. Yeah. And, uh, but they, they, you know, they, 
they yeah, became but, a, but again good like friends freaking doesn't bullshit around so if he wants to make no he he's... does not he certainly he but certainly like, does it's not. like that's the thing that tracy lets it's like come on you don't you haven't heard the stories of of good old <laughs> willie uh, freaking coming to you and not shooting any bullshit with you just telling you how it is like he sets it i will say this in this entire series if he sets his mind to something he's gonna do it and he's he's and he's not gonna back down he's pretty but he's also not afraid to back out of a project no he's, he if he's pat but if he sees the road he's not like yeah you don't hear a lot of these movies are like well it took me 25 years to get to no, this no. point sorcerer was that a little bit a little bit but not like it, it honestly, wasn't after that he didn't really have the cachet no and his attitude does not allow him to no, throw a weight no. around anymore you know what i mean no he can't and, dust uh, off those french connection oscars and go let me make a movie in 2006 you know what i mean yeah With exactly 40 million dollar exactly. budget you know I mean? and you know tracy let's kind of tried to be an actor in dallas he's got these texas roots to him mm -hmm. and he wrote a bunch of these plays based in texas oklahoma um that area and friedkin came to let's and was like i understand what this is it is a pitch black comedy and let's was like okay so let's talk about making this movie and they they, they wrote the screenplay together he kind of expanded the set to make it a little more cinematic and he just brought it to a bunch of studios and eventually he got somebody to take on Michael Shannon as one of the leads because he brought on Ashley Judd and Ryan, I'll be honest. I don't have a huge relationship with Ashley Judd. You're not she a was basically a genre for a decade by herself. You're not a Juddaholic. I am not. Look, my Judd is Apatow. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing you've ever said on this show. And you know it. The smile, folks, that he has on his stupid face when he said that. Oh, my God. I was, like, trying to look up. Obviously, we're going to go down an Ashley Judd rabbit hole here. And I'm looking up her film credits, and he's so fucking proud of himself. He's so fucking well, here's proud the thing. of I himself. I didn't have that locked and loaded. That was off the cuff. My I know. I know. I know. That's why... Honestly, should have expected more, but I got exactly what I thought I would get. Uh, yeah, I mean, she was from the '90s to the two th early 2000s. She was one of the most bankable names yes. in Hollywood, right? She was free money by herself. I mean, she was. I mean, you want to go down the list? I mean, she's. It kind of starts around heat right because she, she's in heat well heat is sort of her like you hello know, i'm gonna be the eighth lead in this movie something yep. like and that. then it graduates it graduates to like fifth or sixth in the time to kill mm -hmm. and then she's in kiss the girls kiss the girls and you got double jeopardy in there which is a huge one for her. where the heart is you know, you got Simon Birch, you got someone like you, High Crimes, again, with her, Morgan Freeman. And then she's got Divine Secrets of the Eye, uh, Sisterhood, Frida, Twisted, The Lovely. It's just a bug. bunch of junk, mostly. I mean, it's, it's mostly it's, junk, it's but you junk. know what? You know what I'm going to tell you about this junk? Okay. People saw this junk. They saw that junk. She was People bankable. saw that junk. We don't mm -hmm. have this junk anymore, Jay. Oh, look, I love junk. You know me. Where's the junk? Like good junk mm -hmm. is actually more interesting than predictable schlock, right? Like everyone tried to make like Madam Web like more campy and shl and like trashy than it is. It's just crap. That's what it is. Like just be just because like you may well, give me a couple all kinds of like give me a couple chuckles, but no, it's like the latest example of like. We get maybe one or two of these movies every year, but like this used to be a cottage industry where somebody could thrive in, where they make these movies that's primarily angled at adults. Like her and Diane Lane made fucking careers out of doing this shit. You know they what did. I mean? 
I like Diane Lane more. I love Diane Lane. Ashley Judd. Have you watched that show? Uh, well, you're never going to watch this show. But uh, no. Feud, uh, Capote versus the Swans on FX. And Diane Lane is, it's like her and Chloe Sevigny and uh, Felicia uh, or uh, uh, Clarissa Flockhart and uh, uh, Demi Moore and, oh, God, Naomi Watts, right? Molly Ringwald and then Tom Hollander plays Truman Capote. Diane Lane in every scene she's in, fucking Just grade A, rocking the house, showcasing why she's like when she's on her a game she's one of the best actresses period i also just what a crush what a crush I mean, uh, you, so what you're saying is you go under the tuscan sun a little bit with her look i'll go under i'll take a trip under that tuscan sun yeah you'd be a little unfaithful with diane Lee? well brian i'm just my saying. wife doesn't listen to this podcast but maybe she will one day maybe she will it's a name it's the name of the movie it's not it's it's i'm, I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one well i mean you know what uh, you know who unfaithful has one of my guys ricky it's got Rich, richard gear yeah i can't wait to have richard gear back in my life i can't wait to have him on the podcast oh my god are you kidding me him and schrader working together do you think ricky's ever been on a podcast do you think he knows what a podcast is He's probably been on what, like Marin or something. I don't think he's been on Marin. I don't know. You never know. You never know. Marin can get a lot. Of, why am we had Marin on? He, I, I got in touch with him for an almost famous episode, and he said, uh, "Absolutely not." Which is rude. <laughs> it's funny we're not even doing Cameron Crow, and yet you just. I know. I was just like solo, solo, uh, almost famous. You didn't want to do Jerry Maguire. There's a podcast about the filmography of richard gear called gearheads really that's a good name for a podcast that's actually pretty yeah or grinding the gears right although they haven't released an episode in a while so that might be uh defunct do you think that like they've been silenced by the hollywood elites that's probably of- what it is the woke hive has gotten to the mm. gearheads podcast well, you know that that's why he hasn't been able to make a lot of films in Hollywood because of his activism and exactly, yeah, him. totally. No, I'm being uh, for let's real. Let's not talk about uh, that anymore. No, let's uh, talk about Bug. Let's um, talk about Bug. What do you? What do you? But like, so you don't know much about Ashley Judd. You haven't seen most of these films. I'm sure this is now going to. No, be a, no, I've seen some of her later stuff, but uh, like I've what? Got no, like what have you seen? Like the Divergent movies? No, I haven't seen the Divergent movies. She what? She had a. She was in Twin Peaks. She was in Twin Peaks, and she was good in Twin Peaks. Yeah. yeah uh, and she... She was in She Said as exactly. herself. That's, that's what I was about to say. She has that one webcam yeah. scene in She Said. Yeah, which is... Which is really something. Remember when <laughs> that movie was going to win all the awards? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, the... the like Mulligan's uh, really good in that movie, and so is Samantha Morton. Maybe um, I haven't even seen her recent stuff. Maybe I just haven't. I mean, she's she's seen not really, stuff. you know, because of probably everything that's happened to her, she really has kind of taken a giant step back. I mean, obviously, you, you understand why, given everything that's uh, right. Know, if you you know, if you don't know, please, you know, we're not going to go. But into she it was a she much, was a she massive was a, deal for a she while. was she was like one of the actresses. Of, you of, could put her face on a poster, and it and would it could get butts and seats, make money. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, not not for this, um, but but this is also a very niche movie, and this this is very small, only four million dollars. It made eight million, which is not bad, but I mean, it's not like you know, you know something to like you know scream about. But yeah, I mean, like Shannon's in this, Harry Connick Jr.'s in this. You know, yes. You know how they met? How did they meet? So there was a, I, I think an opening of a hotel in Vegas and Friedkin was talking to, I can't remember if it was Connick Jr.'s wife or girlfriend. And she kept asking him about like how he did the exorcist. Like, tell me all about your experience on the exorcist. And Friedkin talked to her and talked to her and talked to her for a very long time. And eventually Connick Jr. came over and was like, uh, I think you've talked to her for long enough. And Freakin was like, this dude is terrifying. 
And then Connick Jr. after that was like, oh, I'm just kidding, man. Come on. I mean, I just I'm just playing around. But Freakin was like, all right, he can inhabit that character that I need for Bug. And then Connick Jr. did say, if you ever need somebody for your movie, let me know. I'll do it. I think Connick Jr. is bad in this movie, so <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. But his freaking, accent work is saw something. His accent work is completely all over the place. Um, well, I think like I mean, we should set up what this movie is, which is Bug. It's got sure. Ashley Judd, Michael Shannon, and Harry Connick Jr. So directed by William Freakin. It's chamber movie. piece for the most part. Yeah, it's a chamber piece. It's mostly about these two people that are in a room that are there's a blend of like sort of reality and delusion of whether or not they have been injected or compromised with a bug infestation um mm. and he thinks michael shannon's character which you Peter, we, thinks well, he has been experimented on where they're putting these bugs inside of his skin basically. yes and that's kind of the reveal maybe about like what 45 minutes in something like that. It takes a while to get, it takes a while to get there. It does. It's, you know, for an hour 40, he's presented as this very sympathetic character for great. Well, the movie kind of starts off with very low stakes. She's, you know, Ashley Judd who plays, who plays Angus or Agnes Agnes. down on her luck. Yeah. She's just, well, she's just kind of going through the motions. You know, know, bartender, she's got this, you know, Jerry's sort of abusive guy, boyfriend that comes in and out of her life whenever it's convenient yeah, for him. Jail. You know, he's in jail a lot. He's, he's a complete asshole. He's, she's got a friend, RC, played by Lynn Collins. Pretty good. Kind of um, drugs. Yeah. She's, she's, she's into kind just of like, hanging out with one friend and kind doing of like drugs in their on living the room. Tail end of being like being like a partier, but also like over it but then like not over it to the point in which like she's she's like she can't get past that point of her life social drug user yes yes and so then comes this guy peter played by michael shannon who i mean when you start watching this movie you're like this has got to be the most creepy first encounter well at first See, yeah, at first you're like, oh, this guy's got some weird energy, which Michael yeah. Shannon does, to be fair. I mean, when has Michael Shannon ever been the normal guy in anything? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, man, I thought eight years ago, I thought Michael Shannon was going to be a freaking Oscar mainstay semi movie star. I don't really know what happened to him. Do you? OK, well, do you want to look at it real quick? I mean, we can do it. I mean, we'll we'll go before this movie. He had been a well, you working got, actor. Well, you got to remember. Movie. You got to remember. First movie he's ever in. What's his first movie? I, I don't know. Groundhog Day. Tell me. Oh, that's right. He was in Groundhog Day. He's in, he's yeah. Like the couple that's getting married. He's the he's yep. the groom. All right. So then, yeah, he he has like a run of. Just he becomes a character garbage. actor. Yeah. Well, it's not that. It's just like he's in a bunch of shit. Like a lot he's of garbage. Chain Reaction and Pearl Harbor, Vanilla Sky. He's a little bit in Eight Mile. He's you know he's in he's like in all these small ish movies, and then he gets his big chance here with Bug. And 2007 is a big deal because Bug comes out. And so does Shotgun Stories, which is his first uh, film that he made with Jeff Nichols. So that's where he starts working with his muse, who he's, he's been in every Nichols film, I believe, in one way or another, because um, he's Sorry. in Mud. Um, and then he's he's the photographer in Loving. Uh, yeah, he's the yeah. lead in Midnight Special and the bike riders. He's part of the gang of the bike riders. I guess he's. His Samuel L. Jackson to Tarantino, although he is Samuel his and everything, but he's, he's his De Niro. You know what I mean? Where, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's neither big nor small roles. He's in it regardless. Take shelter yep. also, too. Yeah. And so then that happens. And then 2008, he's in World Trade Center. Yes. And then 2008, he has Revolutionary Road, which is where he gets his first Oscar nomination. And he has 
kind of this three years where he he finds his muse, he has a breakout role, and then he has an Oscar nomination. Uh, and then he starts going on a run where he's like, again, he's the most memorable weirdo in the movie, like Bad Lieutenant, Board of New Orleans, or The Runaways, or and then he's in Take Shelter and he kills in that movie. And uh, you know, and then he he gets to do sort of smaller things, but it's like 2012 is the perfect kind of like what the hell are we gonna do with this guy? We can yeah. give him a lead performance in the Iceman which that movie's not good. We can make him the bad guy in the Joseph Gordon-Levitt bike movie, Premium Rush. Or he can just keep doing his indie movies with Jeff Nichols in mud. And yeah, I but think... But he can like, also be funny in The Night Before. He's the most memorable part of something like that. Mm -hmm. Then they try to bring him into the DC universe and... He's, he's great. Been, God, there's some really. Did you ever see that movie, uh, that Christmas movie that became kind of a meme, Pottersville? No, which one's that one? Uh, that is a Christmas movie where Michael Shannon's character discovers Bigfoot. Really? Yeah. Good Lord. Do you see his 2016? Uh, no. 2016, he has. These are the was titles. That, was Credits. that Shape of Water year? No, no, no. That's 2017. That's the year after. Pottersville is also the year of Shape mm -hmm. of Water. So if you look on the old Wikipedia IMDb world, mm -hmm. Michael Shannon had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten movies come out. Nocturnal Animals year? He's got Nocturnal Animals. He's great in that movie. Loving uh he, that's batman superman donna justice he's got like a credit only he's only in it with like the body midnight special sure he's in like then a bunch of indie stuff complete uh, complete unknown frank and lolo wolves poor boy salt and fire El elvis and nixon elvis and nixon where he's an executive producer i saw that one yeah that's he a is weird one in a bunch of just good to bad crap and then of course there's the current war, which is a movie that is like burnt, like one of the worst movies ever um, released. Well, people um, loved it. That movie made like two hundred fifty million. <laughs> Nobody saw that movie, Jay. Um, and yeah, now he's kind of like I mean, like he's got a great part in Knives Out. He's kind of just like I guess you're right. He's just kind of back to I'm going to do a small thing here and now and then, and and I'm he's not sort of a guy now is kind of what he is. Yeah, but is that okay? It's fine. Like, I'm sure, you know what? I'm sure he's doing perfectly fine. I feel like he's got a much bigger house than I do. Yeah. I mean, he's going to be in the new Joshua Oppenheimer movie with Tilda Swinton and George Mackay and Moses Ingram. That'd be, that sounds pretty promising for him. I don't know if that's coming out this year or not, but you see, he seems like a guy though that should be working with some bigger directors more frequently. Because when he does, he's actually really good. Yeah, it's just been a minute. He just sort of fell off is, is what he did after I really thought he would be one of the mainstay electric character actors we had, which just didn't really happen. But he is that in this movie, Bug, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah. I just think that he's he's a character actor and he we need more character actors. Well, we need more showcases for character actors. This is yeah. not the era of cinema made for a guy like Michael Shannon. No, right? but you know what we it talked is about this with Brian Tallarico. Yeah. Um, when, when he was last on the show, it's like, what is Michael Shannon supposed to do? And they don't make those movies anymore. And I said, you know, Alexander Payne with the holdovers. That was kind of my example of he could do something like that true but they don't make very many movies like that. no but like that's like a movie where like giamatti gets reevaluated for 20 30 years of work yeah, and giamatti is of sort work. of in the shannon zone yeah of, you you bring him in he, but he's, he's led in. more movies more popular movies yeah for sure for sure yeah, i mean he's, no he, yeah giamatti's always got sideways to fall back on. he's yeah. always got sideways he's got i mean he's not afraid to do pretty much any supporting role no, I mean, look, he's he died himself blue for Big Fat Liar, which I mean, of course is his magnum opus. No, he played a, he played an actual monkey in the Tim Burton monkey movie, and he's he's actually Planet of the, Apes. the best part of Planet yeah. of the Apes. Yeah, of that Planet of the Apes. 
because yeah. that movie that movie's atrocious. The movie stinks. Uh, that movie He's funny. Yeah, that movie's awful. Um, but yeah, no, I think back to Shannon. I think he's really good here. I think he's I great. Think, and he originated this role on stage with Let's. So that makes sense. And and Friedkin loved him and the studio pushed back on putting him in the movie and he was like well what if i get ashley judd is that enough of a enough of a selling pull? point that i can still have shannon in the movie and, and they, they were like ashley judd said, eh, i guess so. i guess judd will get you ashley judd movie. we can get all the all the the book club ladies in here for yeah there you go to see bug yeah like, which is a very dark movie well you know they mentioned you mentioned the uh, dark comedy right yeah do you think this is a dark comedy it i don't think really so it really depends on your sense of humor doesn't it yeah Friedkin called it a pitch black comedy i think it I, I don't know if it's a comedy i didn't necessarily feel a lot of the comedy no it's not like the movie we'll talk about next week i feel like it's sort of a paranoid thriller a little bit like or also just a freaking drama about mental illness I think that if you want to really call, Jay, I think if you want to call um, Killer Joe, the movie we're going to talk about next week, a, a pitch black comedy, I think you could do that um, because those characters are a lot stupider. And That is a more heightened movie than this yes. is. This feels more grounded and more serious. And I don't, and, uh, and, and, it's scary. Like I was, I was, I was getting, it's, it's it a very scary. creepy yeah, movie. I mean, the end of the end of this movie is like, if you're laughing dour. at the end of this movie, yeah. like what the, what does that say about you then? I don't know. That's wild. Bill Friedkin, man. Yeah. I wonder what I'll laugh at this movie. Anyway. So what do you think of this movie? Cause we haven't really talked about it. We've no, I like danced it. I around all a, the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's incredibly effective and I think it feels, I, I think the main reason it is so effective is because of the performances. Um, Judd, I think in Friedkin called Judd, one of the most intelligent performers he's ever worked with, which I thought was really cool of him to say, especially with Ashley Judd, who's kind of known for being in these junky thrillers. But for this film, which is really reliant on the actors believing the world that they're inhabiting he just said Judd was totally locked in and, and was doing a lot of prep work and and all that stuff. And it's it's so funny to think that Tracy Letts sort of this king of disenfranchised, paranoid, like middle America trash. Is that offensive to say? Because that sort of is what he's what he, what he kind of became known for mm. because he is such a likable amicable guy it seems like in real life and has sort of become kind of a dad figure in movies but that certainly was not his tempo as he was uh writing writing plays in the 90s um, well i mean you know you you know he, you said he came from the area maybe had some experience, but then he made this big but... he, he became a part of that huge uh theater troupe in chicago yeah and that's where he meets shannon who him and Shannon meet there yeah, and yeah. that's where he meets his wife, Carrie Coon and yep, you know, the best and the <laughs> Carrie Coon important. series coming soon. Very important. Important um, person to all of us. Um, and yeah, I mean, he, I mean, between this and killer Joe, we'll talk about next week and August Osage County, he makes a giant name for himself. Yeah. With these yeah. slice of life, darkly comedic as an auteur. extremely intense mm -hmm. drama, stage dramas. You know what I mean? And yep. yeah, all three of those, which are, are big, are, are now films. You know what I mean? Two. Um, two from Freakin' and I couldn't even fucking tell you who directed Augusto I don't County. know, but we're doing it soon. I don't know. Might be a one-off. Um, but um, no, I think I think he's great. And I think that I think that Freakin' has shown us the sort of contained... john wells obviously who the hell is john wells he directed burnt which one's and he burnt? directed the company men uh which one's burnt uh that's the bradley cooper cook movie oh the cook movie that's I think right it was, it's like the anthony bourdain movie isn't that yeah. how it started yeah yeah it's yeah that's but yeah but it's not really that 
And then he did some of that uh, Netflix show Made. I've never uh, Margaret Qualley. Margaret. Oh, Made as uh, like M A I D. -D. Yeah, not M A D E. Okay. Um. Well, good for him. Um. But anyway, yeah, Jay. I really, I really like this movie a lot. I mean, this. I mean, obviously, this movie deals a lot with with Peter's perspective as someone with PTSD. Obviously, being a Gulf War vet, this experimentation, the idea of also mm-hmm. though, of if any of this experimentation is real or not, the movie being a conversation about what not about what you can see, but what you believe in the belief in another person and these lost souls, essentially. Conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, the, the sense but, of abandonment that leads to, yes to this paranoia. Yeah. Yeah, and then an understandable sense of paranoia. And then really. through the sense of being paranoid and being alone, you found another person that's similar to that, and you cling to it like a moth to a flame. A right, Similism. and and you you're drawn cannot, to the blue light, and you can't get rid of that feeling unless that other person's with you. And I find that to be really fascinating, just because. I think the more I've thought about this in, you know, in, in the case of Judd's character, like we see the mundanity of her life and how it's sort of circling over and over and over again, whether it's intended or not, his arrival, Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon's arrival in the film upsets that in a way that's sort of nonchalantly, but then, it's it is almost weirdly like an allegory for a, a love story of how you know you have all these people that'll tug and pull and push them apart but then ultimately when they are together sparks literally fly and um i find that to be more of the the compelling thing as well but it's also if you look at it then just on the face value it's what happens when an obsession or belief then takes a hold of someone and the dangers of yeah. that too. Yeah. So it's, I find it really to have this really nice balance between it being kind of horrifically romantic, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And so, um, and yeah, and I think both of these perform, I mean, it's, it's two both kind of powder keg performances kind of clashing um, and every, and the just like, and it's only like five or six people in this movie. Um, and you spend a lot of time with Judd and with, with Shannon. They're the and large they just, majority of the movie. And they're just dynamite together. They are. I, I think they're both fantastic. I think the movie is kind of about the self-destructive nature of self-pity and kind of about finding these communities. I thought a lot about, I think this is very reflective of internet culture these days mm. where it's about finding something that piques your interest no matter how destructive that belief is okay and then just having in this case one person uh but but a lot of times online it's about this community of people who just because they have kind of this spark of an idea will then build on that idea and become something like i don't know january 6th you know i mean that's that's kind of how stuff like this starts where somebody has this one idea that piques somebody's interest. And then next thing you know, they're spending 12 hours a day exploring this idea. Uh, and, and I think that really is what's going on here where you have this person who is trying to just cope with this horrible event that she has gone through in her life. The loss, although not, this experienced death of her child, but it seems just he got lost in a grocery store and she has not seen him since, which is even more traumatic in many ways than a kid having a terminal illness or something, because all that you can think is, is he still out there? What is going on? It's just lingering and lingering and lingering. It just is never ending. And that's the exact same way that Michael Shannon feels about his quote unquote condition, his perceived condition where he is this veteran who it, it, it sounds to me like what happened was he was a veteran who was, um, instable in one way or another, 
got put in sort of this military hospital and now believes that he was an ex a military experiment where they put these communicative bugs underneath his skin. And there's this real sense of surreality to the movie where they keep kind of like holding up these bugs where you're like, are they actually holding up anything or is there nothing there? And yeah. It, like does it, the mind, does the mind see what it wants to see? So then it exactly. Can or is this like a totally a truth. subjective yeah. reality that yeah. we're viewing over the course of the movie mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the, the motel room itself almost has this sense of surreality because it's like, uh, it's a massive motel room. What, what are we, <laughs> what, are, what are we doing here? I mean, I know this is a junky motel, but, um, she's and, got the suite, man. She's got Friedkin, the, the yeah, luxury Friedkin, suite. Friedkin did say in uh, in the book, he was like, "We made it a little bit bigger to make it more cinematic." Right? Which, I don't blame him. Which yeah, you know, I mean, makes sense. I mean, I, I mean, if that, you're that, gonna spend your your time only in one location, just make the location good enough. And it to is. It's be. very good. It's very because, like, I don't know. There's. Uh, well, what are the other two we get? We get the bar at a certain point. We get we the get bar a little bit. The grocery store. I think a that's little kind bit. of it. That's kind of it. Most of it is either outside or inside that room. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which, I mean, like, Jay, we've seen so many movies over, I think, like, contemporary movies over the last, like, five, ten years or whatever. And uh, they, they're just inability to use, when they're in single location, to just use the space. It feels yeah, so freaking really is. I mean, he man. had to he had to do these all the time, just sort of out of necessity. But he's so good at it. But he's, it's but but when so you you start doing them out of necessity, but then you start realizing. I think he starts realizing. I think Bug is this movie that he does it because it's his next three movies. Yeah, it's out of necessity, but in here you can really talk about a lot of things, and you can really mm -hmm. get to the core of. Of Very humans psychological and, movie. Yeah, it's it's actually it's just as interesting as making something huge. Movie. Yeah, it's yeah. just as big as making sorcerer. It's also as it's a hard trick to pull off a movie like this. It is. You know, I mean this the you're you're relying so heavily on your 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 cinematography, you're so relying so much on your editing and your acting here, the tension is built, needs to be built within the audience watching this event un unfold in such a way that you want the audience to have the feeling of a of a of a bug crawling under their skin. And that's like kind of what it feels like here. Yeah, represented mm -hmm. not literally, but as like a sense physically. Like, yeah. yeah. You don't want to be like, oh am I Oh, let me think about bugs under my skin. Reality. It's yeah. It's, and they put the aluminum foil on the walls. You're like fuck. You're like it's. But it's not it's, even. But they're not even just bugs. They're like technology bugs that are sending yeah. <laughs> signals to. Well, it's, they're. I mean, they're apeds. That's why they so put they're the like these on. really yeah. even minuscule bugs that you would find under the human eye anyway, right? And that, like, even if you had them, you'd be like, well, only a guy with fucking goggles and like had the the you know like has the technology to do that like an exterminator would be able to find these things mm -hmm. and then yeah then you're like oh and they've got also fucking microchips in them which makes you even sound fucking crazier at the idea of like these littlest tiny bugs are then also wired to attack under the your cells and shit yeah it's but it's one person he's just coping with his loneliness by convincing himself that he has been destroyed by the u.s government but and also too a woman is, who is coping yeah. with uh as intense a sense of loneliness and it's like i need to understand why i feel this way yes but when and does the so when does latch the... on he latch she latches on to what he is how he is coping but when do they attach themselves to one another really when does the the episode start after they have physical intimacy when they have sex well, it is that for and me it's, it's like really it's well like, I, I love the scene early on where michael shannon just does seem like the creepiest guy ever and he's like you're absolutely beautiful and she's like oh, this is a little weird but i guess <laughs> you can sleep on my couch no but like yeah, they go out yeah. to the picnic table yeah. and he's like i haven't been with a woman in forever trust me like i don't care about this and then it does eventually end up being this physical relationship and then the question becomes you know was this his plan all along is he actually like this really creepy 
It's a calculated, uh, cre- cre- calculating guy. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Or are they organically bonding through this paranoia? It's it's a really thoughtful movie in in a lot of ways. I mean, it's it's the idea of like, okay, this guy is going through. You're saying this experience can can only hold it in so long, um, and yet she she does. I mean, ultimately, I think she makes the decision herself in in taking on this relationship and and essentially becoming just like him because she realizes it's what a lot of us do in relationships too jay Mm -hmm. is that we connect with somebody on one thing and then that sort of blossoms from that point and then yeah you know you kind of hive mind it Maybe well, there's a the lot of people, of and I know I know people like this who they're in relationships, and all of a sudden they like all of the stuff that, that yeah. person likes, even though they didn't like that stuff before. There are fucking people that date, okay, and they like the same movies, and they fucking put it on Letterbox, and it's all of a sudden the same it's ratings. Like, it's you, like what you like the Grateful Dead now. You're what? like, yeah, like you guys are. They used every, to like the Backstreet Boys. You rated it three stars, so they got to rate it three stars. Like, what the fuck are you? Yeah. Like, you not have a brain? Well, that's but just it, called podcasting together for too long. <laughs> I know. We're like, we honestly, you and I are like on this on this train right now of really just. We've really been art sort to- of like. Uh, I don't really like on Sundays either. Like, <laughs> you know, prisoners kind of overrated, right? You got a yeah, yeah uh, this obscure movie. Yeah, other, we both the, think the this is amazing. The, the Velvet Goldmine. We're like, yeah, least yeah, favorite Todd. Yeah. <laughs> but then we're like, what's our favorite film of the year? Oh yeah, it's Oppenheimer. The first time in six years that's ever happened where we're both yeah. like, yeah, let's yeah. be on the same page for once. Ugh, should we cancel I, this podcast? I think we're kind of like, I think I'm like done with you. I think that that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Bug is the one that did it. <laughs> So we're like 30 something episodes in it's one like, of you the know what? least Fuck popular it. movies we've ever covered was the one that did it i don't know i think this i think people really like this movie i wouldn't say that's least popular uh, commercially okay but like i don't know people people no people people up. like this one as far as freaking like is concerned this is this is this is one of his kind of hidden gems a little bit so like can i ask you something about like uh the doctor question the doctor character i guess you can yeah. see here um is that like Obviously, we see Peter in this movie a lot, Michael Shannon. Uh, he, I think he's taking everything maybe a little extreme because he is a, a, an unstable human. I being. think he's a pretty chill guy. Oh, yeah. You you grab a beer with him? Yeah. <laughs> um, the the doctor character, Dr. Sweet here, which, I mean, yeah. you might as well just fucking call him Dr. Pepper at this funny name. You know, funny name. Um, essentially, what I was gathering was is that he was more of his psychiatrist rather than being maybe. And then like, he was sort of enabling, it was almost like shutter Island. Like he was like essentially like enabling the story, but it, it, it doesn't go to that. Allowing extent. him to ha- have these yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Sort of the other thing I was, I was thinking a lot about shutter Island with it when it came to the sort of subplot there, but anyway, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't disagree with you. It did seem like Dr. Sweet was sort of trying to what really I, what ease what I mean. him into uh, uh, more normal thoughts. I suppose mm-hmm. it, it seems like he had a keen understanding of just how unstable this guy was and that it wasn't just a matter of telling him that he's paranoid. He really had to, be a lot more delicate with it and it uh cost him his life yeah spoiler alert well i mean this movie's been out what close to 20 years now yes but if you made it this far if you listen to <laughs> a bug episode for 45 minutes you know, <laughs> i assume you've watched it yeah i do love the i mean what i love so much about this movie in the second half of the film is when they do put the fly paper and the aluminum foil around everything and the lighting all changes oh, yeah. and, and the, it does the, the the lights are such a nice touch where it totally it, it makes the movie go from kind of this greenish brown to this blue where yeah, and, the, and the whole aesthetic of the movie shifts it looks almost like a sci-fi movie a little bit with all the silver and silvers and blues and but then and essentially kind of awesome. it's it is it is them the metaphor becomes really real and, and therefore it's like they are two bugs trapped in inside of a zapper and 
it's only a matter of time before they zap and they, they oh yeah it becomes so it claustrophobic yeah it's and it just builds and builds and builds and i mean the physical violence that shannon does upon himself to to get under his skin oh to, the tooth the, the, stuff the tooth stuff fucking hell i mean good lord that is it, crazy that's that is one of those scenes where you're like oh so michael shannon will just do anything on screen this dude is incredible yeah it's it's it is that level of like kind of like what you would expect i guess who would be the who is the equivalent now of doing that we're like very keogan yeah I guess like youth, right? Because like Driver was that at one point, right? Where we felt like he he'll do anything. I don't even know the Driver was. I don't that even think he did that. Shannon, Shannon has. You're just a, saying like he's a little freak, and and he's going to go all the way. I'm saying Shannon was a little bit of a freak, and Barry mm-hmm. Keoghan now is just like I will do anything that you tell me to do. I am a a, a, a little a like little Joaquin. Freak. Like, oh, like Joaquin's Joaquin? definitely got some of that. Um. But Joaquin, Joaquin might even be older than Michael Sheen. Oh, yeah. But I mean, like still in this age, I mean, we talked about in the master, like that physical right. performance is, is insane. He is. Like, yeah. I, is In general, I wouldn't call Michael Shannon a terribly physical performer. No, but he's a he's a weird here. He he certainly is. But he's just a, a guy. Just he's a creep. He's really interesting. I mean, all of his publicity stuff when he does interviews he's fucking so dry off-key. and funny yeah it's it's yeah he is very know. funny and he's dismissive he's sort yeah. of the uh pro i think kyogen's just a, johnson yeah. <laughs> i think kyogen's just a tease i think kyogen kyogen loves the attention i feel like michael shannon doesn't love the attention as much i think he i think kyogen but i think they have center similar energy i don't know if he loves the attention i just think he's very they're both very comfortable with who they are and then therefore they can slide into anything that they want to be like the fact that i've seen so much uh of barry kyogen in the last year kyogen is one of the most fearless modern actors yeah he's just like you need me to whip my dick out and dance around he'll be embarrassed he'll get naked he'll be crazy he's he can, not afraid to uh overperform. Certainly. he's got good range he's honestly he's got kind of the perfect range you want for a movie star he's just not for a movie star for a character oh yeah well you yeah, know well i mean he doesn't have the face to be barry keoghan is not a lot of people think barry keoghan is is a babe i mean like he's a very he's, unique he's got a rock looking guy yeah he's like um is walking phoenix a movie star I mean, he's got a billion dollar movie. He wasn't Joker. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I don't know if you know this. He won an Oscar for a billion dollar movie. Like he's God. I forgot that he won the Oscar for Joker. Yeah. When that's when society Maybe Barry is. Keoghan will win his Oscar for Joker as well. I mean, that's what it seems to be for certain people. You just got two for the, two for the No, I, I no, take it back. Jack, Jared Leto. Well, Jack didn't get one either. I was, gonna say two for the, I was gonna say two for the last two, but I forgot about Jared Leto. Yeah. Ugh. I think a lot of us forgot about Jared Leto. And that's fine. It's fucking terrible. When are we doing a Leto series? Never. The fifth of fucking We're never. gonna make it an actor watch. Oh Jared yeah, Leto. we're gonna do Morbius. Yes. A little things. Right? Is that Have what you've seen is? uh Madam Webb? No. Are you, do you think you'll ever see Madam Webb? Yeah, I'll probably see it on a plane. I'll watch it at home. I think a plan, yeah, because your father in law is going to buy the That's movie, that is and you're going to watch true. it I on watch like it for free Easter. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, oh, that'll be great. That'll be a great Easter movie. That's a pretty good Easter watch with him. Father, son. Madam That's Madam. how. That's how you watch the Flash. That is how I watch the Flash. I think something like that. I something don't know. Like that. Isn't that how you watch Cocaine Bear? This is uh, for, for no, many. I actually people- watch Cocaine Bear at home. The last thing I watched with them was Rebel Moon. Oh, the Zack Snyder, Zack Star Snyder, Wars, Star Wars wannabe rip-off. bullshit. Yeah. yeah, for many that. people that for many people that don't know, and this is your first time on Director Watch, or we've never actually explained this bit. Um, side note to everyone is that Jay's father in law uh, and and y'all and y'all's iTunes account are connected, and he just I, we have his password for his yeah, iTunes account. Yeah, and uh, essentially he just buys whatever movie he wants which is usually junky stuff that i would never buy on my own yeah like for example you know uh, madam web madam web 
or 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 when I go over to visit them, I will watch whatever junky Netflix movie. You really never out. watch quality with them. Not really. Very rare. Like I'll I'll tell you the one movie that really sticks out in my mind as something that I absolutely never would have watched is uh The Man from Toronto. Is that the uh Woody Kevin Harrelson, Hart? Kevin Woody, Hart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, despicable. Despicable film. What okay, can I ask you, what does he think of these movies? I mostly think that they kind of just wash over him. And he doesn't he's just, think about them very seriously. So at he all. so he's not really watching them for enjoyment. He's mostly watching them to pass the time. To pass the time? I, I don't know, kind of. And Has he, he watched and like and he's like, Yeah, you know what? I don't want to I mean I don't want to yeah, talk to it, you. <laughs> this is noise that I can half watch and understand. Okay. Sort of a little bit. Do you think he would like watch Oppenheimer with you? No. I don't think so. Really? Because that's a movie you have to pay attention to. I just don't know. But it's so weird because he does pay. There are times where you're kind of like, he, oh, he's totally locked in right now. You think he watched like the holdovers with you? No, definitely not. That, but that's like a quintessential like dad movie. You think he, he likes Iron he Claw? Likes, he, likes, he likes action. You think he watch no, Iron he, Claw? he wouldn't watch Iron Claw. No? No, he hmm. would watch Dune. Would he watch Dune? Okay. I he would kidding. watch Dune 2. Dune too. I'm not sure that he would like it, but he'd watch it. I think if you ask him to explain it to him, he probably wouldn't be able to fucking tell you anything. He grew up on comic books, so he's very attached to. Well, then you're, comic that's book sold. Stuff. There you go. You're gonna watch Madam Web. That's Count like me in. Yeah, you know you have to be careful with when Jet stays over there because he's gonna watch so much crap that it's gonna like feed over it in your house. Look, I've got all my posters in my basement. I've got a whole Malik wall now. He will be raised on good quality cinema. That's that's what I want to hear. See, this is he'll music at, to my ears. He'll look at the sorcerer poster on the wall and be like, that looks fun. Let's watch that. <laughs> Dynamite. Dynamite. And I'll be like, all right, let's skip the first like 30 minutes yeah. uh, and get to just the intense stuff where people aren't necessarily dying and then we'll skip the parts where people are horrifically dying at the hands of uh dynamite God, what a good movie anyway Great back movie. to back to bug is there yeah, anything bug. else you want to anything else you want to say about it yeah i mean there's plenty of stuff to talk about it the, yeah, let's the, go. The, the the finale where they douse themselves in gasoline and God. set themselves on fire and it's this really impressionistic kind of uh, it kind of takes you out of the universe of that movie. And there's a few moments like that in this film where Freakin does have that documentary style, but there's a couple of things in this movie where he's really elevating the movie outside of the scope that you would expect from this, again, kind of chamber piece. Um, and I'll tell you one thing that's really interesting about the movie. This was, this was the era of shoot everything in New Orleans. They had the craziest tax credits in the world. So this was shot not in a studio, but they set up the stage in a high school gym in New Orleans. Wow, really? Yeah. And two weeks after the movie stopped shooting, Hurricane Katrina happened. So interesting. just kind of an interesting point in time for this movie to have happened. Um, and... You know, Shannon has really nothing but good things to say about Friedkin. And he really does give Judd, Judd is good. I, I think Judd is quite good. I don't think she's asked to do as much as Shannon is. I think Shannon is really incredible in this movie. Do you agree? Yeah, I think he's incredible. He's like, I mean, I've always been in the bag for Shannon. But... I'm a Shannon guy. There, there are some. I, I think it's just because of when they kind of hit their biggest, but like Michael Shannon, Ben Mendelsohn, there are a few guys who Ooh. I'm like, these, these could have been, why haven't these guys been the best character actors of the last 10 years? Mendelsohn. And they both kind of got swallowed up by blockbuster stuff. Mendelsohn has made so much money in the last decade because he was doing, you know, like ready player one, Marvel stuff, bloodline, um, 
He was kind of a the outsider. go-to yeah, he's got Disney like guy shows. a little bit. Uh, yeah. He was a blockbuster, big blockbuster guy. It's kind of uh, like Star uh, Wars, Star Wars, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, like Mads. Was, yeah, was a little like bit, a little there. bit. But Mendelssohn doesn't even have like his, um, uh, another round or no, he doesn't have like, uh, what was it? The promised land that came out this year. No, no. Like I mean, he, yeah. I, I remember seeing him in a movie. I don't even love, um, place beyond the pines. Did you ever see a startup with him and Jack O'Connell? Uh, no, I haven't seen that one. You know what else I haven't oh seen? What's God. the one he's in with, uh, Ryan Reynolds? Oh, Mississippi grind. Yeah. Haven't yeah, seen that one either. Oh my god, he's yeah. fantastic in both. You should watch Start Up. It's really good. It's like Jack For me, really the like one prison. was um it's great. It was, an, it was Animal Kingdom where I was like, "Oh my god." He's really good in that movie. Um yeah, Mississippi Grind's Mississippi Grind proves that Ryan I need to see that. Ryan Reynolds can actually be a good actor if he stopped being Deadpool for five fucking minutes. Well, that's not going to happen. So nope, because Deadpool three coming this summer. Yeah, I was looking at Mendelssohn. What's he done? Oh, killing them softly. He's awesome in that too. He's great. Would you say place beyond the pines? Right? Yeah, he's. Great I said place beyond the pines. Baby teeth. Baby teeth is that is a good movie. Which one's baby teeth? Baby teeth is the one with um, Eliza Scanlon where she kind of has this oh i remember that one guy. yeah with essie davis too right yeah yeah that that movie's really good and she's kind of like sick or something and yeah and, uh, yeah exactly is it exactly. toby wallace right yes mm -hmm. yeah and By she way. uh yeah. she may or may not die at the end i don't know spoiler alert <laughs> yeah that's a that was a 2020 20 movie, uh, australian it says movie. 2019 but i think that might have actually come out wide in 2020 yeah we were watching that during the pandemic and i remember yeah. you and, and that I really was uh, a movie shannon yeah. murphy is a director of that she hasn't really she hasn't made anything since then well oh, i mean I, you know. I thought that was a really promising debut film what's he doing now what's, what's he is he in, in Mendy? yeah yeah well, i'm sure he's doing something that dude works all the time it's got to be i mean you know what my wife just watched and he's all over that is that uh that show the outsider yeah you watch that thing i haven't seen it but yeah i'm, I'm familiar it's because she you oh know, he was in that um he's she's big into daisy the ridley Steven... movie daisy the ridley. marsh king's daughter i have no idea what you I'm familiar with that one? no yeah, it's kind of daisy idea. ridley a lot of people say it's kind of good um daisy ridley then, like making a trying to make a comeback she's got like four movies this year she's doing another star wars movie right and it's exactly it's like you can make all those movies but you know what you're going to be making Oh, I was like, what is this? He's in a Boz Lerman thing. Do you this think is the far Jay. away downs, the uh, Australia? Re oh, it's the, oh, the reappropriation. Oh, yeah. I'll never watch that. Um, Jay, do you think that the. Oh, he's in the next uh, Fleck and Bowden movie. Freaky, freaky tales. Okay. Um, do you uh, do you think that uh, they're going to course correct and make a good Star Wars movies to fit that timeline? Well, I mean. Look, what what has Star Wars been doing, right? They've been doing Nothing. so I have watched half a season of Mandalorian. And oh, I was like, that was okay. Okay. I have not watched the Boba Fett show. I have For not watched the um Osaka? What's the Rosario Dawson show. Ahsoka? Have not watched that. I haven't even watched Andor. I heard Andor. That's is great. the one that people say is genuinely really good. But the problem is, is I know how that ends. Yeah, but I know can, how that ends for that maybe guy. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey, my man. No, it's about it's about and the that's a, it's look, about maybe the it's got some Michael Clayton energy. Well, you, know? you and I are big, uh, not a big fans of Rogue One. No, no we're not no. huge on Rogue One. We're not huge on that one. But that doesn't you, mean I won't like Andrew. No, know? it's not. But it doesn't. I don't like. I like Diego either. Luna. I like, oh, I love Diego Luna. Like, that's not an indictment of Diego Luna at all. Everyone that I trust says Andor is good. It's got my, uh, so it's I, got, I do need, I do need to watch that. It's got my guy riding it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Michael Clayton in space. Man, I do love Michael Clayton. That's just, that is, um, ever. I, I don't know. I, I, do we know who's directing the next Star Wars movie? Yeah, it's, uh, I forgot her name. It's the first female director ever to be to make a Star Wars movie. Well, cool. 
Um, I mean, we can obviously look this up. It should be Catherine Bigelow. She's making her own movie. She's making. Well, you know, I, I was watching the um, I was watching the documentary, the William Friedkin documentary, Friedkin Uncut, which is kind of like his De Palma. Mm-hmm. It's just where they're just talking to William Friedkin about his career. And he called Catherine Bigelow the most talented American filmmaker currently working as of a few years ago, which I thought was interesting. I mean, he's not wrong. I, I don't know why she had to go into jail for the last. I don't know why Detroit buried her. I'm, I'm not really sure what happened there. Like, I love but... D. Reese, but like that movie that she made with Ben Affleck and Anne Hathaway is far oh, worse boy. than Detroit. Like, what are we talking about? Does D. Reese about? have anything working? I don't think so. She should who's, though. Did like, you see who's doing the Star Wars movie? Uh, it y- yes. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this name. I, I do apologize. Okay, it's gonna be great. Uh, Charmaine Odi uh, Chanoy. Um, What's she's her. History? She's a Pakistani director. Um, she made. She's made a couple of smaller films. Uh, but most more importantly, she did a couple episodes of Miss Marvel um the television well, series and okay so she's directing it and Stephen knight um who we all know can be as inconsistent as ever uh but also mr piggy blinder himself is doing the screenplay for it that sounds not terribly promising I but it be can't honest. be any worse than what we it got can't be before worse than rise of skywalker i mean that was atrocious do you think uh, but I don't know. They're doing is that a this is like a Daisy Ridley trying to rebuild the Jedi training or something. Is that what it's about? Yeah, it's like the new Jedi Order is what they're calling it. Jedi babies? <laughs> yes, Jedi babies. Well, this is the interesting thing. It's like they're not why calling you get it the person who did Miss Marvel. They're not the calling guys. it episode ten. They're not Bringing back Boyega, obviously, or Oscar Isaac, it seems. And they're doing the Mandalorian movie, right? They're, and they're, they're doing the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian. But that's the thing. It's like they always, they into... always fucking say that they're going to do something, and then they back out. It's like they're just edging us and edging us and edging us, and then they, and the, there's nothing with it. Baby you know Yoda, I mean? though. He is pretty adorable. Um, I got to tell you this, though, about, about this ending of this movie. Bug? We're going back yeah, to Bug. We're going back to Bug. Because uh, that's, that's what that's what this fucking show is about. Uh, Obviously. Supposed to be. Um when they pour the gasoline, mm-hmm. top five worst things in my life to smell is gasoline. I well here's the other thing. They've got hate. open open wounds and they're yes. pouring gasoline on themselves. And so it it is terrifying and just I, I by that point when I was watching, I was like They've got to end the scene. Just light themselves on fire right now because it was. It was. I. I. I was very affected by that scene. I thought it was. I thought it was completely. Mm. Oh, well it's done very visceral. Freaking. This whole movie yes. is very visceral. You, you yes. feel this movie physically. Well, it's such it's a the it's, scratching it's, of the bugs. It literally gets under, under your, skin. your skin. Yes, and but I think I. I. I wouldn't call it a mean cruel movie i just think that it's it's just it's no i think it's actually a very empathetic movie it is and that's what i love about it it's it's like actually like but it doesn't dwell on the no it doesn't like either no it's 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 more matter of fact like this is a sad reality of life almost it's like it's almost like trying to deny this thing that you're trying to repress this worst thing that has ever happened to you in your entire life Mm-hmm. And then the one thing that reminds you of it is this man who abuses you, who has now been let out of prison. So it's like her trauma being re-released onto the world. Yeah. Um, it's it's great writing. I think let's he knows what he's doing. That's why he edited uh, the book in Little Women because he's a great writer. <laughs> Wait, are you you're saying because he's the book editor in, in Little Women? Yeah, he's the or what is it magazine editor in that or whatever. He's a publisher. Publisher. Right? Yeah. So yeah, he was he was marking up her writing cuz he's, he's yeah. got all the experience from that is canonical to Tracy Letts writing but I'll, right? I'll still yeah, I'll still say yeah, of course. The writer yeah. in Little Women had already written Bug and Killer Joe. Yeah, there you go. All right, I get you. All right, I get you. All right. See, that's where I'm um, going to. And I still he's think, married to Carrie Coon. Lucky I still guy. think if Tracy Letts uh was replaced will ferrell and barbie it would have made the movie a little bit better 
I think you could have picked a dozen other people and that would have made uh, Barbie better. It would have been great to see like Tracy Letts like running around like that. Like old man Letts having fun. No, it would have been. I mean, Farrell Farrell is one of the most important pop culture figures of our lifetime. In my life as far as establishing my taste in For absurdist comedy. Yeah. Um he's washed. Yeah. He's washed. He should do what Sandler's doing. I would love that, but he did. What he, What did he try? He tried um, Stranger one, Than Fiction. Well, he did uh, Stranger Than Fiction, and then the other one I think of is Everything, Everything Must, Must Go. Go. Yeah, you see that one? They're not bad. They're not they're, like they're not uncut jams or punch. No, but love, like, but you know? but like Sandler had to make like funny people and and rain over me before he started working with the safties like you know what i mean like yeah but he's already done punch drunk love he done like yeah i know what I, i'm not I sure know. that Farrell has that in him it's easy to say he should try to do that he might not be good at it i mean Farrell was i mean i know he's he's not great now but like Farrell was working with like woody allen and some other key, you know no. directors and early on in his career we've all worked like, with woody allen we don't like to talk about it but. <laughs> yeah that's exactly yeah you're just speaking timothy chalamet's language right now anyway um but no i i think i think he i think he could but um but yeah bug very good movie i liked it a lot i like this movie a lot i think it's really good i think it's I, very I effective it's, it's 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 honestly a little hard to talk about because it is so kind of compressed it is. It's. Uh, I mean, and, and in its small sim- and experiential. Well, it's in its simplicity. Yeah. Is then when it, it 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 blossoms out into you start thinking more about the paranoia of these characters, their connections to it. It is a movie that is felt as much as anything, so it's kind of hard to talk about. Yeah. No, for sure. But it's but a very it, affecting, very affecting movie. Uh, very. I, I think both of the leads are great. Shannon is tremendous. I think. Yeah. No, I think I think they're both great. I think they're both great. Any last things you want to say about but um uh, I like the color palette of the movie mm-hmm. and again how it shifts from that kind of grayish greenish brown early in the film which give this gives this real sense of kind of sterility and and grime and then it turns into this real almost sci-fi um completely unnatural tones of silver and blue at the end i think it's shot very well especially for a movie like this that is again kind of that chamber piece what is the i was thinking about this what are good examples of recent kind of uh super contained movies like this Hmm. the most recent one did you see sanctuary yes i did see Sanctuary. i like sanctuary i think it's okay I don't love it, but I, I don't I think love it's, it either. It's pretty good. I I I I like Margaret Qualley and I like uh, Christopher Abbott. Uh, I I think it's a well done movie. But like the more prestige ones, One Night in Miami is okay. I'm not. I mean, I mean that's what it is. It's mass. okay. You're not a big fan of Mass. I don't love Mass. You really like Mass, right? I thought. I just thought what it, what it was saying in in the film. Was, I thought it was really beautiful. And There's got to be I, one that I'm just not remembering. I think from a directorial standpoint, I totally, from a visual standpoint, I get what you say about Mass, Jay. Like, it, it, like visually, it's doing nothing. It mm-hmm. is a play. But then I, I still think that it's uh, pretty effective and beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. when it's what were other ones? What was the one with uh, Emma Thompson? Oh, good luck. Good luck to you, Leo Grand. That one was all right. I love that movie. It's it's that Emma Tom, Emma Tom and Emma Thompson was very good in that movie. Yeah, but I don't love that movie. Kimmy was sort of that for a while. Kimmy's got most that for most of it. Kimmy's a right, great movie, exactly. and then it turns into something much bigger. I love oh God. I just love fucking Soderbergh. Soderbergh rocks. You see that they're releasing uh, the Ocean's movies on 4K Steelbook. Uh, yes, I did. I mm, did. Yeah. We might talk about oceans later in this episode. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. All right. No, don't, don't, okay. I, um, I feel like they're very popular right now, though. Well, you want to know why? Because they're cheap. I was and because of COVID. Yep. 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 Check. Yep. Check. Yes. I guess the is the father that. I guess the father is that. The father is totally that. Yeah. 
But so. then you have to like reevaluate. Like, is the father really that good? Did you see the son? I never watched this. You never watched the son? No. <laughs> Which some people say is like one of the most despicable films of the last decade. Not it, it, just bad, but immoral. It's bad. It's so silly. It's actually kind of stupid, but it's like it's <laughs> the best way I can describe the sun is, is a movie about obviously uh, their son has uh, a depression and and uh, mental health issues. Hugh Jackman. Yeah, Hugh Jackman, Laura Dern, Vanessa mm-hmm. Kirby. It's a good cast. Anthony Hopkins. Vanessa Kirby, Fantastic Four. What you think of that Fantastic Forecast? I love how the listeners are going to get this in like six weeks. Um, whenever when we're recording this. I thought it um, was underwhelming. I thought it was predictable, just like mostly everything else that Marvel's doing right mm-hmm. now. So it was not like it was like All right, let's dreamcast Fantastic Four right now. Uh Michael Shannon as the thing. Like like there you go. I mean, that sounds good. I mean, it's not a bad idea. Um, uh, Charles Melton and Greta Lee as uh, the Invisible Woman and and that sounds good. Johnny you just got that from the most recent Hollywood Reporter. I've been ever, listen. Yeah, I, it's, it's they have been hanging out with each other all season long. They are two of the hottest people on the planet. The fact that like, Greta Lee looked incredible. Yeah, she's very important to me, and uh, I think that I think that like in the original film like it was jessica alba and chris evans who are i mean maybe not the best actors but they're incredibly like good looking people and like vanessa kirby is uh, very good looking but then you look at like joseph quinn and you're like oh it's just the eddie guy from stranger things like Mm -hmm. he's replacing chris evans who is Mm -hmm. like an insanely beautiful man so like no and like pedro pascal um yeah i mean like good are you ready for mine i got it i got it right here ready here we go uh jason biggs mr fantastic (laughs) heather graham uh, oh you're going like invisible woman you're going like in the past which you would have or there no no this is current and i'll tell you why okay okay uh jason biggs heather graham for the thing i'm going with jake paul and human torch i'm gonna go uh zach galifianakis and i'm gonna do that because that way we won't lose any good people doing other stuff this these are fair points like the eben moss bagrack casting is so depleting to me like the guy's been a, a essentially like a, a supporting or a character actor for his entire life, wins an Emmy, has like this insane role on the bear, and then what does he do? Fucking Marvel, and now he's gonna for be him, stuck. I in mean, I t- from his perspective, he's got to be like, I finally get like a I check. Did it. Yeah, yeah. And but like from our perspective, it's like, oh, dude, like I know, I know. you know, I know. I can't, I can't fault these people for doing it though. But like, here's the rough, other, here's the other economy out there. Thing. Here's but the do other you, interesting thing do about you want to it. attach yourself to that shit though right now yeah. it's not being as good as it was that's know. almost all tv people yeah is it safe to call pedro pascal a tv guy he's a tv guy i think he's a little bit more famous than that he, he's not a movie guy i think he's just a i mean vanessa kirby's not a tv person she's been in mission impossible movies no, no i'm saying she's the one she's the one exception i would say Oh, you're saying all the dudes are TV guys? Yeah, Stranger yeah. Things, Bear. Yeah, this is this Game is of Thrones, fair. Mandalorian. This is fair. Pedro Costiel. They're not. So, they're, yeah, that's just interesting. And then what? Vanessa Kirby was. I I want to say she was on The Crown, but that might just be because she's British. But no, I think she, she was, was. No, she was on The Crown first season. Yeah. First two seasons, she was Princess Margaret. That's how she got known. Yeah. But she's also an Academy Award nominated actress. So. She is. What was that movie called? Pieces of a Woman. Decent movie. She's nobody, very good in it. Nobody talks about it. What are you talking about? Nobody talks about that movie. People won't shut up about that. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I back to Bug again after another tangent. Um, 
I think these performances very focused episode. Yeah, we're very, we're all we're all over the place. Uh, I think the screenplay is great. I think Freakin's direction is again really really solid and just he he just knows how to get squeeze the most out of every um, lemon, no matter how small it is. He's just really able to just get the most juice out of this movie and. Yeah, I think Brian Tyler's score here is really great, and Michael Grady's cinematography really is the heavy handers uh, to build the tension. It is for both yeah. of it, and yeah. uh, Nara Navarro uh, is editing too. Like this movie, from a technical perspective, is a really fascinating one that more directors should look at in terms of how to build tension within a a a single location. Yeah. film by the way a single location if you want to include it the the lighthouse is technically they're on that island. well it's a, it's a single that's location. fair it is largely a single location and yes. i will say one, one thing i do like a lot about this movie is it does feel like friedkin kind of abandoning his quest to become a super commercially viable director again he's just like i i just want to make good movies i just want to make interesting movies his now. late stage yeah, he's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not making hundred million. Which I appreciate. Movies. Yeah. I'm just gonna make movies that are interesting to me and have complexity to them that I can provide my take on. And, and he's got, he's got what two more movies after this, and then a documentary he made in uh, over the course of a weekend. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, and then sadly that's it. Yeah, we'll talk about those other two in the next two weeks, but uh, we sure will. But we we're gonna talk about this Oscars for. A long time. I feel like we. Well, how many nominations of this one? Well, Jay, before we get out of here, we're going to test your award season knowledge based on the movie we just reviewed in a mm-hmm. segment we like to call "It's an Honor to Get Nominated." Mm-hmm. Jay, I know you're alluding to it with uh, supreme sarcasm. Um, Jay, how many Oscar nominations did Bug have? Uh, zero. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So was, give me the so I, I think there's only one Oscar I might nominate it for, and it would be actor. So give me who were the best actor nominees this year. Okay, well, this is the year. And remember, we gotta play we gotta play the role of this movie came out in 2007. Right. So it's the 2008 ceremony. Ceremony. But what do we call it? Do we call it the 2007 Oscars or the 2008 Oscars? <sighs> you you keep the eternal question. You keep doing this. It's the 80th Academy Awards. All right. We'll call it the 80th Academy <laughs> This is the year of No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood, Michael Clayton, Juno, and Atonement. This is our beloved 2007, and it is a movie that is part of that um, fantastic decade. Would this make your top 20 of, of 2007, one of the great years of all time? Mm-hmm. That's real Did tough, isn't out? it? I, I see 2006. Did this get this wide in 2007? It, okay, so it premieres in 2006 at Cannes. Okay. But when it, it premieres. Yes, it's released in 2007. Okay. Like, it goes right. May 2006, it premieres at Cannes. Then it goes and plays the festival circuit, including Fantastic Fest, mm-hmm. in the fall of 2006. But it does not premiere in America until... 2007 so it qualifies for those okay Oscars. i would be surprised if this makes my top 20 so you want best actor or you want best actress give me best actor best actor of course the winner was uh daniel day lewis for there will be blood a movie that we have talked about we sure have before. i think he's quite good in that film i think that movie is pretty damn great and mm-hmm. i will say so very out loud george clooney for my beloved michael clayton Jay knows how much I love. We love it. We love it. Do you love it? Uh, I mean, you love it more than I do, but uh, I, I quite like it. I the need movie, to watch it again. I might. Uh, Ryan, honestly, doesn't that feel like a movie I should love? No shit, Sherlock. I need to watch it again. Uh, this wouldn't. This would be outside of my top twenty, but I, I, I do like it a lot. Johnny Depp for the uh, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Uh, your guy, I mean, John, your guy, Johnny Depp um we're we're both are we in agreement that shannon would be a lead yeah he's a lead yeah okay i'm just making sure uh tommy lee jones for in the valley of ella haven't seen it gotta be honest it's not a bad movie jones is really good in it uh that's a that's a makeup nomination from the hunted it's a makeup nomination from 
not getting and supporting for No Country for Old Men. That is truly absurd. Uh, what? They should have got nominated for that? They should have. Well, I guess it's just because uh, Bardem would, probably, right? Would you call Jones a lead or is he supporting? No, no, he's movie? somebody. Well, it's almost like who is the lead in that movie? I think it's Josh Brolin. Brolin, I guess. Yeah. 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 He's the closest thing to it, but then he Maybe dies. they're like co-leads and and Sugar is the secondary. I don't, he's definitely the supporting Sugar. Yeah, um, for sure. And then Vigo Morgan said for Eastern Promises. Uh, I mean, he's good in that. Fucking love Eastern Promises. I would um do Cronenberg one day. That would be fun. He's made a lot of movies. Yeah, a lot of good Uh, movies. I mean, I haven't seen the Tommy Lee Jones. Do you think Michael Shannon is better than TLJ? Yeah. I actually I actually like Johnny Depp and Sweeney Todd a lot. I like that movie. I I I I I like that movie. I mean, if I'm looking at it like other people I would throw in. I mean Brad Pitt Brad Pitt wasn't nominated. No ridiculous lead Jillian hall well Zodiac. no like casey affleck's the lead of that movie it's a co-lead they're co- you could go co-lead yeah you could go co-lead yeah honestly the oscars would probably pull affleck supporting pit lead right yeah because affleck, affleck got affleck got nominated for supporting carol yeah because affleck got nominated in supporting actor so yeah you're you're so, not far like, off no, there no obviously no zodiac you know, you could throw Hall in there. Yeah. Uh, you know who I would throw in there? Who? John C. Riley and Walkhart. But <laughs> I know that never would have happened. <laughs> That's great. I love that. But he he is certainly qualified for that. You know, you know who should qualify too? Like he would be in the realm of like a top ten. Mm-hmm. Ryan Gosling for Lars and the Real Girl. Yeah. He's fantastic in that movie. There's you honestly like, a lot of there's there's a lot of a lot of movies that I don't love with some really good lead performances. I am legend. I think Will Smith is really good in that. Bale and Bale and uh, pick a and, guy. And I was about to say three ten to Yuma. Pick. I one. was gonna say Bale or or, or or Russell Crowe. Hell, you know who's great in three ten to Yuma? Never got his flowers. Hmm. Freaking Ben Foster. Holy shit, he is great in that movie. Um, yeah. I'm I would, just looking at. I'm just looking at this year in movies. I just Glenn, watched Glenn Charlie Hazard Wilson's for, War for the first time, just because it was Philip Seymour Hoffman. Wait, birthday. did you just did you just watch that? Because I watched it on a plane recently. Yeah, I watched it for the first time. M- extraordinarily mediocre movie. <laughs> PSH PSH kicks so much ass in it. He is unbelievable in it. Hanks is all right too. Hanks is okay. It's kind of weird seeing Hanks be a womanizer. Yeah, because he's like America's because it's him. America's dad. Yeah. He's yeah. he's okay, but PSH really is. Would you nominate Judd and an actress? I probably not. Do you? Want I think me to, she gives a good performance, but I don't me, think it's exceptional. Do you want me to give you the nominees? Yeah, you can give you can give them to me. Um, Elliot Page for Juno. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura Linney for The Savages. Mm-hmm. Good movie. Julie Christie for Away from Her. Um, haven't seen that one. It's a good movie. Sarah Pauly directed it. Um, very good movie. Uh, Kate Blanchett for Elizabeth, the Golden Age. I, I gotta say, I haven't seen that one either. Sorry, Kate, I might kick you out. I might put Judd in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Marion Cotillard is the winner with uh, Le Vie en Rose. Oh, yep. Yeah. I mean, the the thing is, it's like you you could kick somebody out, but then if you look at all the other movies that you would kick people out for, yeah, you know. Didn't even you know, mention I would, them. I'll tell you who I would nominate this year. You ready for this? Here we go. Amy Adams Enchanted. Oh, you're just, oh, you're talking still in I'm that. I'm just talking about anybody. She's unbelievable in that movie. I'm not a big fan of Enchanted. I, the movie is, I, I think the movie is pretty good. Mm-hmm. That is a, she carries that movie in the same way that Margot Robbie carries Barbie, where. That movie is nothing if that lead performance is That's not as committed as it is. I didn't. Re- I didn't. I forgot about Enchanted. And did you see Enchanted Two? No, it looked Disenchanted. Right, is what it was D- called. Yes, Disenchanted. That's bad. <laughs> it gets real CGI goopy. I think that that is a cautionary tale to every uh, buddy that wants a Barbie sequel. Don't do it. 
it's okay well, to just have the I one mean, that thing. one would be sooner than Enchanted. The real cautionary tale is freaking Hocus Pocus 2. Good grief. <laughs> that thing was brutal. And Ryan, yeah. and you know I've seen Hocus Pocus as much as any movie in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Against my will. But yeah. That's the movie that you're forced to. That's the one that the wife makes you watch. Yeah, that's a real I don't know if there's a movie that my wife That's a real Billy makes Crystal me watch. Marriage. Oh, marriage. <laughs> marriage. That's when you watch Hocus Pocus. Hocus. I don't four know four times a year. But seriously, I don't know if there's a movie that Megan makes me watch all the time. We watch a lot of Devil Wears Prada and a lot of Hocus Pocus. See, you know what she, you know, what she's been actually doing because we, you know, because I added more films to the shelves mm-hmm. because uh, a friend of mine gave me a, a bunch of movies for free. Um, we started pulling these action movies off the shelf, so we pulled mm-hmm. off. Oh, are you getting into action movie junk like I am? Not necessarily junk, but we're watching mm-hmm. some good. I think we're watching some honest classics that we haven't watched together and then i think we're getting break speed we're we're talking escape from new york oh there we go we're talking robocop oh robocop that has the single greatest line in movie history uh what i'll take that for a dollar no you know what it is bitches leave (laughs) (laughs) It's the best slide. If you've never seen RoboCop, please go watch it just so that you can see the the dad from that 70s yeah, show. Yeah, that is funny. Literally Red. scream, bitches leave. It's the best line reading ever. And the and then go watch the YouTube video of the behind the scenes of Rehoven explaining that he thought that like bitches was just a saying and and that the, that's just like the norm of what you can call those characters. It's insane. Verhoeven, one of the best. Love the guy. Yeah, there's been some troubling uh, Starship Troopers discourse the last few days as we're recording this, but... Is it? Like what? Like, eh, like I'm just saying was... it's bad. Well, that some people are saying it's bad? Yeah. Well, they're wrong. With very bad faith arguments Aww. in my opinion but is that because like all the dune stuff's coming out and so there before you no, gotta like slap another movie i think it was just a, a thought stray thought that somebody had classic twitter situation well you know how those people are online they're fucking idiots they except are our except our listeners yeah. who know that we love them uh, yeah we've everything. got the smartest listeners dude yeah we do because they know that starship troopers is an amazing movie and they do and uh and they've got taste you know, so Jay, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Speaking of the internet and Twitter, where they can find yes, you and all internet. your work. Uh, yeah, you can find me lead with Letterboxd. Uh, Jay Ledbetter on Letterboxd. Find me on Twitter at Mr. Jay Ledbetter. Any work I'm doing, podcast written or otherwise, you can find on uh, Awards Watch and AwardsWatch.com. Uh, that's it. That's me. You don't got a movie recommendation or anything? Oh, movie recommendation. I rewatched Oceans 12 as we're talking about Oceans. Holy shit. What a movie. Just one of the greats. And, oh, you know, it was, it was it. interesting because my wife loves the Oceans movies. And one night we were just like, ah, what do we just throw on? And and she said, and she likes all 11. of them. Uh, we haven't watched 13 in a very long time. We watch Oceans 11 and 12 all the time. It's been years since we saw 13. Okay. Um, and then eight obviously doesn't count, but, um, <laughs> I don't hate eight, eight. I, I hate eight, but, uh, really? yeah, it's quite bad. Um, yeah. but, but she, fun. she originally said 11 and then right as we turn 11, she was like, you know what? I think I might like 12 more. Let's watch 12 which is a very interesting take because that sounds like a, think, more of a you take than it does an alley take. It does a little bit, but I think she likes the Europeanness of 12 and kind of the, it's a little bit of a sexier movie. I think a little, in some a little less tidy. Right. And she also likes, I think that it doesn't have all the origin story type stuff that 11 has, oh, but that's great. That stuff. I, just... I, I, I agree with you, but. Um, yeah, we watched we watched up. twelve, and I think that is a I'm gonna call it a messy masterpiece. That's uh that's how oh, I yeah. feel about that movie. It's the movie rules. It's so good. It's so good. Um, 
So a little, Ocean's lot 12. of Go lot of great again. Great meta humor from Soda Pop. Oh that. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so the 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 fact that he just undermines how cool the first one was from the first scene of that movie. Yeah, where it's like they're all miserable now and domesticated and like stuck. Yeah, they it's, almost it's, like it's so good. They almost like need Terry Benedict to get you know light a fire under their ass. In right. Order to exactly. This job. Exactly. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, it's the so best. good. It's and, great. And Vincent Cassell. Oh my god. Oh yeah, I mean the laser sequence at the end, incredible, fucking brilliant, just brilliant. I know Soderbergh hated making those movies because they were so meticulous, and they and the cast had such a blast. But God, well, damn he was terrified. Yeah, he was terrified by them because of how big they were. Yeah, but they they worked. They were great and movies. That goes to you know he says about Mad Max. He's like, I have no idea how they made that movie. I have no idea how thirty people didn't die making that movie. I would never make a movie like that. Uh, and then you know, Oceans George, is the closest he's ever come to something like that. And you know what George Miller said? Yeah, let me go ahead and make another one. Yeah, um, that's coming out soon. What do you think about that? I'm worried. It's, yeah. I'm I, worried that it's going to be very hobbity. I wasn't super encouraged by the trailer, mm -hmm. but I I'm I'm I have faith in George Miller. I love George Miller. He's a genius. What do you think of that? Uh, Three thousand years of longing. I respected it immensely, liked many parts of it, but in totality didn't adore it. I had a fine time watching it. That's kind of how I felt too. I don't think it was atrocious. Or there were some moments of real greatness. Yeah. And the structure of it, I didn't find particularly compelling. Yeah. It's kind of undersold himself in the structure, but yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, letterbox at Ryan McQuaid 77. You can find all my work here at awardswatch.com, uh, iTunes, Spotify, five star reviews, please. We'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, go over the website and uh, sign up for the newsletter, it's where you can get all of our stuff, all the reviews, interviews, podcasts, and one. Uh, things sent to you a couple times a week. That way you can keep up with everything that's going on on the site. Uh, Mondays are when the Awards Watch podcast comes off. Uh, so you get this one on Thursdays and and you get that one on Mondays. Uh, movie recommendation, I'm just going to go with RoboCop. You know? you can't go wrong with Robo. Movie that absolutely... Verhoeven, that's one of my guys, man. Fucking rips. Um, I need to watch more of his stuff um but the stuff i have seen i love i have seen all of his hollywood stuff yeah i want to see his um his his other movies that european are european stuff yeah, his european stuff i do not want to just watch his his hollywood stuff though his hollywood stuff is wild and fun and it's got great commentary like you're talking a lot like robocop has just this great i think conversation and through line about an absurdity about how we cover the news and how police involvement and political corruption and um sort of pts the idea of ptsd there and how that is used and and how it's abused but then also yeah. it's extremely violent and a lot of fun yeah, I and i think i think is one of the great i think he's one of the great american satirists ever and i think it's partly because he's not from america <laughs> exactly like i think he yeah. he can see our country and see right through the bullshit and i think that it's i think it's a great movie i've never i've actually i've never seen the sequels uh, because I haven't, I, I haven't either. I've never seen another because I just because I you know why? Because I think that this is just good enough. Sometimes well, you know into, they just turn into junk, which I'm in my junk phase. I might have to watch them. But, I think you might uh, have to. But I but to me, Jay, like I think sometimes it's okay to just do one and that's it. It's yeah, okay. I mean, it is it is interesting how everybody's like all they do now is sequels and stuff, and it's like I mean they kind of started doing that a while ago. The '80s was like notorious for that. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's going to do it for this week's show. And uh, we will be back next week. Jay and I in here, we are going to be uh, we're going to be getting some fried chicken. Yeah. And we're going to be sitting back going through the drive through and we're going to be talking about some killer Joe. That's A next normal week. movie. No, no one's ever said that killer Joe is controversial or I watched that one with my mom. She loved it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she it was a very comfortable experience watching it with her. I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure she really 
Really appreciated that. And she she immediately afterwards was like, let's get some KFC. <laughs> Real bonding ex- mm-hmm. exercise, that's for sure. Well, we thank you all so much for listening, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>